here. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I, um, uh, one one thing she she told she told me was that she's been sending me a few patients, and one of them, uh, the way we measure things, I I gave the patient um, curcumin, and she told me that curcumin destroys estrogen. Oh, and, it's and, a aromatase inhibitor. It's it's yeah. So, okay. I, okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. So I fall in that category. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I call this. I decided to call this the specter of estrogen dominance, because it's no simple thing. It's really complicated. So I want to go back to two pioneers, Dr. John Lee and Dr. Katerina Dalton. So here's John Lee and his natural progesterone book. John Lee, toward the end of his career, uh, depending on Dr. Ray Pete's work, used progesterone, and he didn't use large doses, 20, 30 milligrams, I forget, in 100 patients to treat osteoporosis. And he reported positive results, and he went on to write, <clears throat> to write this book. And I do recommend, if you've never read this book, it is a good foundational book. And he's the guy who defined, <clears throat> defined estrogen dominance. So it's a ratio of estrogen to progesterone. And it doesn't mean that estrogen is particularly high. It would just mean that progesterone is lower. So it's, it's defining the relationship between estrogen and progesterone that he was talking about. Now, John Lee was very adamant that you only need needed about 20 milligrams of progesterone. That's what the body produced, and that's all you should use. And he quickly embraced saliva testing, which sort of reinforced his low dose of progesterone treatment. And uh, we'll, we'll go on because I was looking, I did a deep dive looking for this evidence of 20 milligrams of progesterone being produced. And I finally went back to Ray Pete and asked him, and uh, he was kind of, he didn't offer me any proof for the 20 milligrams. He did offer a proof for over a hundred milligrams in the uterine vein. And progesterone is produced all over the body. It's not just produced in the ovaries. It's produced by the adrenals. It's produced inside cells. And we'll go into that. And then here's my hero, Dr. Katerina Dalton. So she started publishing long before the 50s, but this was her book, Once a Month. And she characterized premenstrual syndrome, PMS. And she had tons of symptoms being related to uh, this premenstrual syndrome. And sometimes it could get quite severe. Uh, PMS could um, have suicidal tendencies. You could have homicidal tendencies, extreme headaches. Um, these, these were some uh, very serious cases, um, seizures that were identified by her and treated with progesterone. So she was talking about how these progesterone receptors were all over the body and explained the, the vast difference in symptoms that women were getting during the luteal phase. Her treatment was generous doses of progesterone. Uh, she started out with injectables. She then moved on to uh, vaginal suppositories, the strength of these would be 400 to 600 milligrams. You might need more than that. <clears throat> I started working with Women's International Pharmacy, and we were uh, compounding and using her philosophy, we were uh, doing a compounded progesterone in oil. It was before Prometrium came out. We used safflower oil first. We switched to olive oil. And the dose for luteal phase, PMS, was a starting dose of like 400 milligrams, one capsule four times a day. And uh, 
very quickly, we found with, with the m many practitioners working with these women, we might need a lot more. We called it breakthrough. When women <laughs> did not have all their symptoms relieved by this dose. So more and more things got compounded. We did rectal solutions. We did suppositories, rectal suppositories, vaginal suppositories, vaginal creams, topical creams, lozenges. We also sold the injectable. So uh, I've seen doses in those cases up to 2,500 milligrams was the largest I could, could um, remember. But realize this, um, for the most part, women got relief from their symptoms with these large doses. So we have, you probably all recognize this uh, chart with the menstrual cycle. And if you look at progesterone, it doesn't look, it looks insignificant in the follicular phase and barely topping estrogen in the luteal phase. But the units are in picograms for estradiol and nanograms for progesterone. So in your mind, please move that black line for progesterone a thousand times up. And suddenly you're going to realize how important progesterone is, not just the luteal phase, but both part of the menstrual cycle is very dependent on progesterone. I put these in here for some numbers. So on the left, it's in nanograms. On the right, picograms for estrogen. Left is progesterone. So those numbers should be multiplied by a thousand to be in the same units. So here are some of the signs we recognize. You'll find this on drug inserts from the FDA, some of the uh, signs of side effects of estrogen uh, products or just excessive estrogen in the body, breast tenderness, headaches, leg cramps. Um, diminished cell oxygen, I think, is an important thing to uh, think about. We don't really do that. Vaginal bleeding, um, I'll say more about that later. It's it's an issue. It's a big issue. And we'll go on. So after I left Women's International Pharmacy, one of the things I missed was speaking with patients and helping them solve their problems and answering their questions. So I took myself to Facebook. And uh, there I found what I was looking for, because what I was looking for were the failures. Too many practitioners lose track of their patients and they think they might be doing a good job, but they're not. And there are women there who have seen multiple practitioners who've been unable to help them. And they go from practitioner to practitioner. And it's, it's abysmal. On one of these Facebook pages, this is a very popular page. It's run by the CEO of Onas. Onas is an over-the-counter, has over-the-counter products with hormones. The Estrogen Dominance Support Group. And uh, this is published in the group, but this is a very important concept. And I brought this to them. They call it estrogen kickback. So for lack of a better word, we'll use that. So when you use a tiny dose of progesterone and it's not enough to really balance or really give you all the progesterone you need, one of the things that happens is your estrogen, and now I think maybe adrenaline two activity gets enhanced. And so many women will be out there saying they can't stand progesterone, they can't take it, I sent them to the hospital with panic attacks, heart palpitations, 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams. This, this is not infrequent. Now, John Lee liked to recommend a product called Progest. It was 16 milligrams at the time per dose. And we at the pharmacy, were, we're selling it, and we found this was problematic, this very kickback kind of thing. But we also knew from our work with Katerina Dalton's um, guidance that this was like the breakthrough. You need more progesterone to fix it. 
And so we would uh, talk to women and recommend that um, they talk to their doctors to get more progesterone than they were using. Dr. John Lee addressed this at one point. Um, I heard him at a conference um, in New Orleans and he said, oh yes, women are complaining of issues with the progest, but just continue to use it every day and in nine months, all will be well. Well, I don't, I don't know about your patients, but none of my friends would, <laughs> would settle for that. And then we knew because of the breakthrough PMSers that we can resolve this in hours, just give more progesterone. Another thing that's kind of interesting, I pulled this off the website, look at um, estrogen and progesterone is deliberately misspelled. This website, this Facebook page actually was challenged for recommending progesterone. So I'd like to introduce a case study we'll talk about at the end. This is Janelle, she's 45 years old. She's had a hysterectomy, bilateral oophorectomy. Um, the diagnosis of PMDD puts her in a certain protocol. And you can look at Wikipedia and find that protocol. Interesting enough, the word progesterone is never mentioned there. So it, this happened in the late 90s. Uh, Prozac's uh, patent was running out and they searched to find a new indication that they could have approved by the FDA. So they did a, a study and uh, reported that 50% of the women in the study with these emotional symptoms of PMS, which they now renamed PMDD, uh, would respond to SSRI. So Prozac was approved for that. And it's, it's kind of an interesting story because um, PMDD, was, they got an approval for PMDD before it was actually defined. So there's a lot of shenanigans going on there. So the next thing you try is birth control pills when that doesn't work. Um, gonna add a trope and blocking agents like Lupron to shut everything down. Uh, they try that. And then the final solution is that you have surgery, you have your oophorectomy because you are too sensitive to progesterone and you want to avoid progesterone at all costs. So what happens to somebody then? We, we all know this. Uh, women with oophorectomy are given one hormone back. So, so our person here, Janelle, she had es estrogel. She's suicidal, she's anxious, she's angry, tender breasts, insomnia. She gets offers of benzos, antidepressants, sleep agents. She's got hypertension. Um, and nobody is going to help her with progesterone. She's going to um, uh, be readily drugged, but they're not going to touch progesterone. They're going to withhold progesterone from this patient. And these are some of the most complicated patients that you will come to your practice. So what's that progesterone doing? Like John, C John Lee said, multiple roles. So it does balance estrogen. Um, it is said that it's happening at receptors with estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors. I don't know if that's the only thing. I don't know if it's a yin yang situation. I don't think we're really clear on that. Progesterone is a precursor to the cortical steroids. So um, hydrocortisone, cortisone, and all the other derivatives um, can be made from progesterone. And so if you've been adrenally exhausted, you might have great deficiencies going on there. Some people call this the pregnenolone steel, which was defined as pregnenolone sucked up right into the cortical steroids. I don't know if there's evidence for that either. So progesterone can balance low blood sugar, it can bring a low blood sugar up. And some of this may be involved in adrenaline. Adrenaline goes up when blood sugar goes down. 
Progesterone has independent synthesis in the Schwann cells along with pregnenolone. It's, it's made de novo from cholesterol in the brain and it acts as a neurosteroid. It's your body's aromatase inhibitor and 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It's made in mast cells. We have a whole hormone factory in the mast cells. And there's the sense of intracrinology. This is particularly important after menopause. All these hormones being made inside our cells and not directly from an organ. And it has antioxidant and anti-inflammatory qualities. So on the other side, we have um, a lot of things contributing to problems with estrogen. So we can have methylation deficiencies. So we're not uh, detoxing estrogen very effectively. But keep in mind that methylation is the primary detox mechanism for adrenaline as well. Uh, the estrobiome, we, we have bacteria that can produce estrogens. We have um, enteric hepatic recirculation of estrogens. When some bacteria produce beta-glucuronidase uh, to um, um, uh, to cleave off a conjugated estrogen goes right back into circulation. We have xenoestrogens. Um, all these outside estrogens that we find in insecticides, pesticides, metalloestrogens, heavy metals can sit on hormone receptors. Then we have fungal produ production. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae produces 17 beta estradiol, for example. Uh, glyphosate is estrogenic and it's prevalent all over the place. We even have tests for our glyphosate burdens these days. Uh, growth enhancers in, in meat, cattle are actually injected in the ear with 17 beta estradiol. Uh, Dr. Al Pluckner was a veterinarian and uh, he claims he found this immune system nexus. He would test in animals and then humans. He tested about 2000 humans with looking at total estrogens versus IgA, IgM, and IgG, and beta cells. When those were down, the immune complexes were down and total estrogens were high. Um, he he uh, said this was a uh, symptom of a disconnect here. And interesting enough, the correction that he used was hydrocortisone. Estrogen therapies will give you um, extra estrogen, of course. So here's just one um, paper on progesterone synthesis by itself in the nervous system tissue, in the Schwann cells. So that hormone never gets measured, and it's not going into general circulation. It's produced and used right there. Neurosteroids in the brain, as I mentioned before, um, they're created in the brain de novo from, from cholesterol. The nice thing is that when you use hormones exogenously, they also go through the blood brain barrier so your body can use it. But otherwise, uh, these hormones are made in, in the brain. Okay, this is a book by Dr. Michael Platt, Adrenaline Dominance. And so I began thinking, one of the things we were thinking about this estrogen kickback is, is like palpitations, panic, severe panic. And I began thinking this might not all be related to estrogen. It may be related to adrenaline as well. And I think there's another little interesting piece here. I've been studying adrenaline, he says, goes up when blood sugar goes down. It's, it's a mechanism to bring more blood glucose to your brain. Um, the trouble is, I believe, back with the methylation issue, when patients are unable to bring that back down. There was... Um, I think it was Melvin Page, but it could be, could be another one. Back in the 30s or so, there were some dentists who were really endocrinologists. He called, he called this thing liver insomnia. 
And liver insomnia would occur when you wake up in the wee hours of the morning and your mind's busy and you can't go back to sleep. He recommended that you have an apple by your bedside and eat the apple and you could go back to sleep. So what was that apple doing? It's bringing your blood sugar up. The need for adrenaline is gone. And um, so that might be a tie-in in, in, in what's happening. So there are many, many people with this kind of adrenaline goes up and it's not shutting down. Now I've been asking people when I'm talking to them, I do consulting, I do some consulting and I've been asking when this comes up once in a while, um, I may have some test results with homocysteine, which can give us a hint, but many, many people know um, uh, MTFHR has been um, measured and they, they know they have methylation issues. So I think this is part of the problem that we might be thinking is estrogen dominance. This is really um, interesting. We don't think of progesterone as an antioxidant. This is a really interesting paper, if you would like to look at it, about the um, possible use of progesterone for um, retinal diseases. And um, it shows that it increases antioxidants like SOD, which could be very helpful. Dr. Ray Peet, who I mentioned before, so progesterone is a basic brain protective anti-estrogen. So it, it works on many levels in the brain, as, as you can see, as he's saying. He also mentions vitamin E, like progesterone and aspirin, all act to prevent inflammation. So um, damping down oxidation. He also um, has, in some of his newsletters, talked about using prolactin as a measure of tissue estrogen. We have many ways to test hormones, saliva, serum, urine, now we even have tissue um, tests, but w none of these tests tell us what the tissue load is. And if pro prolactin ends up being a good predictor, I, I think it's nice. Prolact elevated prolactin is not only dependent on excess estrogen and hypothyroidism, there's other things such as tumors, but something to keep in mind. And um, if you have excess estrogen activity, um, this um, G. Bourne, who has uh, quite the, the book on heart tissues, bones, suggests that high estrogen levels creating high prolactin in turn could be actually creating osteoporosis instead of the um, kind of social convention that you need estrogen to, for good bones for it actually uh, is indicated for slowing slowing down the loss of bone but not rebuilding bone particularly A uh, vitamin E here also brings down prolactin. So it's kind of a confirmation that prolact, um, that you can moderate pro prolactin with both vitamin E and progesterone. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, might be another tool in our toolbox of what we can help, help women with. Here's, here's a refer reference for glyphosate and its estrogenic activity. Um, we don't measure this as, as a 17 beta estradiol, but we could be loaded with glyphosate. Here's a 5 alpha reductase system, and both progesterone and testosterone are acted upon with this enzyme. So progesterone, when it's in balance, should be giving you a correct balance between testosterone and progesterone and, and that type of activity. So something to consider. We rarely look at this carefully in men, but look what we've done. We uh, created a molecule called finasteride, which is in Propecia for hair loss and um, Proscar for prostate enlargement. 
So why in the world are we not going right to progesterone, our own natural hormone who should, that should be providing this balance in our body, finasterides loaded with side effects, including uh, loss of libido, loss of sexual function, depression, and even suicide. So um, it, it bothers me that this is going on so much. So intracrinology, uh, there's a lot of work done at McGill about all these hormones that are made inside the cells. And, and it's a major mechanism uh, creating hor other hormones from DHEA, particularly after menopause. And uh, this is really uh, a common thing. Oh, we need to do inhibition of aromatase, particularly when we are giving um, testosterone, particularly testosterone in men, but realize that glucocorticoids push that aromatase for one thing. Um, so you should be looking at that. And then progesterone is a natural balancer of this process. Uh, here's the mast cell issue. Um, I've been taken to every time I, th I hear about some new condition or what's going on, I go into the literature and I look at what's the relationship with that particular issue and the steroidal hormones. There are lots of papers with mast cells and estrogen and progesterone. If you have an excess of estrogen to progesterone inside the mast cells, you're going to promote histamine release. So I've um, listed a few of these symptoms with histamine that um, may be coming into your office and you identify as a hormonal issue. So it's it's involved in asthma and allergies, hot flashes, uh, um, low mood, anxiety before a period, bloating before a period. Uh, migraines, dizziness, insomnia, all of that some, somehow sounds a little bit like estrogen dominance, but it's histamine re uh, related. That's the mechanism it's going through. I found this at, at the last moment. Look at this. Uh, progesterone should be useful uh, treating some of the COVID type symptoms that we've been looking at. And uh, it, it looks really promising. I, I did this lecture for Dr. Haas's group and I had this paper in there and I posted it on my uh, YouTube channel and I posted it on my particular page. And guess what? It got tagged with, it's got a big tag over it to go to the CDC, even though it's a, a published paper in a peer reviewed journal. Okay, I, I've referred to one of the big things that happens with progesterone that causes serious problems. And I, I think it's probably one of the biggest problems is underdosing. And here is the other big problem, dosing with progesterone. If you have somebody who already has issues with candida, progesterone dosing can make those worse. Now, progesterone does bring up the blood sugar. It does suppress some of the immune components that allow you to carry an alien baby when your progesterone goes up during pregnancy, but it also allows for uh, excess candida, which can be also a problem by its interference with hormones in the first place. So I've listed here some general health things that you, you can um, a tribute maybe to candida, well, the sugar cravings, brain fogginess comes up a lot when um, you're giving progesterone, um, re really a lot. Dizziness comes up a lot. Uh, vaginal discharge. Uh, Dr. William Crook wrote the yeast connection. And he told me personally, if you have any burning and itching, always think yeast. But it's not that you have a yeast infection right at that particular organ. You're having the toxins, the mycotoxins from that yeast being released um, 
into into that tissue and that's what's burning and itching so a woman could go in with um burning vaginal tissue and they do a swab and find absolutely no candida but the mycotoxins are there and they haven't uh, um, check for that. I once uh, counseled a, a woman who called Women's International and she was in a wheelchair. Uh, she was paraplegic and she had extreme itching and she said she wanted to kill herself. It was so uncomfortable and I said well there's probably yeast but here's something you can do for a temporary fix and until you can get the bigger guns in. I said, get a perianal bottle and wash that tissue off every time you're, you're in, the, in the bathroom. And this removes those mycotoxins from the tissue or do a sitz bath. She was always just showered, that tissue didn't get cleaned very often, hence it got so, so, so bad. So once we realized that this did work for her, then we could go ahead and work on candida issues, but it's, it, gives, it gives women quick relief. So uh, if you have any kind of issues, you know, in the luteal phase, in the normal cycle, women are complaining of constipation or diarrhea. This can be because there's some candida involved. Acid reflux, any kind of indigestion. On the skin, hives, um, acne, uh, psoriasis even, mouth, um, I was just counseling a, a woman with a huge amount of allergies and stuff, and I've just gotten her uh, to do one day now of extra progesterone. She's feeling better. Her itching is stopping, but she's already noticing the white coating on her tongue. So we know there's candida involved. So PMS, erratic periods can be candida, postnasal drip. And any kind of sinus infection, chronic, if you treat it with antibiotics and becomes chronic, you know there's going to be uh, fungus in there, uh, likely candida is most frequent. Um, you get all these emotional things here. We think about estrogen excess um, in this situation for some of these things, but it might not be that at all. It can be this. And fluid retention as a progesterone deficit, well, maybe so, but it's also tied up with the candida. Uh, weight gain, uh, you can't lose weight when you're out of balance with this. Um, itchiness, uh, like I said, Dr. Crook had, had mentioned itching and burning. Uh, tinnitus, uh, that's coming up sometimes when I'm talking to women. So something to look into, this if you ever hear a weird symptom after you start hormone therapies, think candida first and see if that if you can find some other symptoms that they haven't told you yet. That's that's an issue with this. So some time ago there was a um, public uh, group they called themselves the Candida Research Group. The CEO of this group gave me a whole pile of papers. And I thought, what am I going to do with it? And I, I decided to uh, make a table of all this literature, what the resource is, what the organism is, and what impact did that organism have. So you'll find this here, a lot of things interacting with estrogen and progesterone different mechanisms. So I give you this more as something you can look at later. Um, as, as you go through this, if you want to go through it again. So I've got about four pages of this. I, um, another thing, I, I threw this in here because we have, again, a supposition that sex hormone, hormone binding globulin means that those hormones aren't available to us. And here's a mechanism that's been identified with a, a lipoprotein called megalin. And um, this whole complex, the hormone with the sex binding globulin with megalin can be absorbed into the cell and produce its action. So um, when we measure uh, sex hormone binding globulin or free hormones, we can't really negate 
that this also has a function going on. This is also, they call it endocytosis, because a cell just uh, kind of grabs it and takes it in. Okay, uh, just in the last week and a half, this paper was published way back in 1998, and I actually had it on my in my computer, and I hadn't paid much attention to it, obviously, but it came up on a Facebook page again. And this was um, a group of women with PMS symptoms that were treated with potassium, no hormones, but potassium, and got great relief. And I'm thinking maybe this is an area we need to pay attention to as well. Estro progesterone production is related to the concentration of potassium. And when we do serum potassium, it's a very small amount. Most of the potassium is intracellular. And then if we also have a magnesium deficiency, then we lose even more potassium. Um, the cofactor and coenzyme for progesterone is magnesium as the cofactor and B6 as the coenzyme. So if you are using larger doses of progesterone, it would behoove us to pay attention to these two things to make sure we're not creating another depletion. So um, because of A4M, I listened to a few talks. So here's an, a few other conundrums. Uh, one speaker talked about um, unfilled estrogen receptors create inflammatory molecules. And the recommendation was to give small amounts of estradiol, always to make sure you had that covered, or testosterone if you were male. Another speaker talked about potential hormone resistance akin to what we see with thyroid and vitamin D receptor resistance, um, that you have circulating hormone, but it's not getting into receptor properly. And then another speaker talked about membrane damage, which would um, damage the receptors. And in this case, the recommendation was phosphatidylcholine, um, also uh, the peptide MOTC. Okay, so let's go back to Janelle. What are we going to do with her? Poor girl. So first of all, as I mentioned before, you've got to you've got to give her sufficient progesterone. And I counsel patients to use progesterone and use more right away. If you start with a dose and your symptoms worsen or are not relieved, use another dose in 15 minutes and do this till you flip. You actually, your patients will flip into calm. And um, this happens consistently. And it always seems a little scary. It's very scary for women who've had negative experiences with progesterone in the past. Um, but it, they can do it if they want, if they want to find help, they've got to somehow get the progesterone restored. You need to stabilize insulin and glucose because of that adrenaline response. And this is another thing that progesterone acts as a balancer for adrenaline as well. So one of my colleagues told me that her client was wearing a continuous glucose monitor. When she had a hot flash, her glucose went down to 50. So I, there's probably a tie-in in the hot flashes. Food sensitivities affect your, your blood glucose, so maybe it should be investigated too. So methyl and sulfur groups may need to be added to the diet or supplemented to help detoxification of estrogens and adrenaline. You might need to do some liver detoxification. Remember I was talking about the liver insomnia. Part of this problem, the liver is not storing enough glycogen for the night. So maybe a liver detox is in, in uh, order. Heavy metals, mercury and other heavy metals sit on hormone receptors and block the activity. Could you use antihistamines 
along with progesterone in some of these cases? And I think yes. And some of those patients may already be on antihistamines, but I would think quercetin and um, of course progesterone and vitamin C as potentials. Vitamin E spares progesterone. So maybe you can get by in a little less if you also take care of the vitamin E. You can add pregnenolone, hydrocortisone. I did have a couple clients I, I worked with um, with progesterone, but they didn't seem to make hydrocortisone very well. A small dose of hydrocortisone made a big difference, like, uh, like according to uh, William Jeffries. Uh, salt to, to help your uh, adrenals, always good. Um, vitamin C and B5, B5 is especially used by the adrenal glands. Proteolytic enzymes are situations where we're having a lot of inflammation by immune complexes. And as progesterone is also an anti-inflammatory, bringing down this inflammation, with breaking up these complexes and digesting it with proteolytic enzymes. Candida protocols, I can't tell you what the best one is. There's so many uh, techniques and um, hopefully some of you have some and, and maybe could have some comments on that. Uh, Dr. Ray Pete uh, recommended very highly a carrot salad, shredded carrot, and then with vinegar and um, oil, uh, coconut oil. And uh, this was taking care of some of the ex excess estrogen in the gut, helping, helping mop that up. I was in an office uh, for an IV and somebody was getting an ozone treatment and on their um, form indicating what ozone might do for them, it says ozone may detoxify excess adrenaline. So I, I don't, I try to look and find extra information on that. I came up not with too much, but um, back to estrogen excess, a, a low oxygen, cellular oxygen state, and maybe with adrenaline too. As I mentioned, potassium, adding potassium to, to this. And um, there's a kind of a very special potassium thing I want to share with you. Uh, Dr. T.C. McDaniel uh, used to uh, work in Cincinnati. And he did chelation and uh, whatnot, but he um, used this powder he called Zeta powder. When I first learned of it, I had no idea what it was, but I have found out it's three potassium salts. And um, you do 30 grams of each of those salts to make about 90 grams, and you dissolve that in a liter of water, and then one teaspoon a day of that in, in some water. Uh, improves your potassium levels. And to my surprise, I found the same triple potassium, um, uh, three, three uh, potassium salts promoted in Max Gerson's book for cancer patients to keep them alkaline. So when I'm looking at, at test results, I'd look primarily insulin and glucose. Is, is a main driver in all, all of this hormone imbalance. And then I look at adrenals. If you don't have adrenal support, you can't really support thyroid with uh, thyroid supplements. And finally, look at sex hormones. Um, this is Bocan Baru and Bocchetti, Panama at dawn. I think we're at the dawn of new medicine here where we actually are, are working to help patients in, instead of just drug them with toxic substances. And finally, here's my contact information. Thank you. Hi, Carol. Love it. Um, Question for you. I, I don't know if you know about this. Um, I've been hearing this. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I've been hearing about this controversy. You know, we all hear about soy and phytoestrogens and all of that type of thing. And maybe uh, uh, I need to be enlightened here. But what I'm hearing is that the phytoestrogens 
don't really have the that similar of a chemical structure to our own endogenous estrogens, whether it be estradiol or what, and actually can bind to a an estrogen receptor site which inhibits our own estrogens. And therefore, they're saying that these can be used for estrogen dominant cancers. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, I, I've heard so. And I, I've heard, I've actually heard the the opposite through the years. And oh, yeah, there's, yeah, there, yeah. there's a big soy council uh, promoting uh, that position. So I would I would read carefully, very much in in any study that promoted it. I'm not I'm not comfortable with uh, soy protein and soy products, particularly. Uh, we like overuse it. We'll we'll do a soy protein powder. It has such negative effects on our our um, thyroid functioning, which in in a uh, cancer situation. Thyroid is usually suppressed anyway, so I it would not be my first choice of thing thing to do. Um, some of the other estrogens, herbal type estrogens, also have been in question. If, do they block, and is that useful, or are they actually contributing to a problem? So I I don't know. It's not really my my I I haven't done enough research into that that area. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I just, I thought that was interesting that we've all heard through the years, oh, you know, for estrogen, stay away from soy. And now I'm hearing that that's like a bunch of, of bunk that it's not, it's not that bad. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure it's not used to treat anything. They're just saying it's not going to stimulate our own estrogen receptors. Yeah. And it could be know. dose related. Like, like, uh, uh, soy milk, for instance. Um, I walked into a health food store and the owner's drinking a whole quart of chocolate soy milk. Well, what about her? <laughs> so she, <laughs> wow. Uh, what's what's happening with that? So I, I don't know. I can't really say. Okay. Uh, Dr. Patel. Hi. Good. How are you? Good. Uh, so you think uh, the PCOs are... Uh, estrogen dominant syndrome or they have a problem with the period and Hi. did you see did you say pcos correct yes yep um they they may be estrogen dominant they may not be uh, it's both and some think that there's some problem with progesterone receptors with pcos um I, I think it could be a dose related thing too with PCOS. If you don't give enough progesterone, it may not be effective. Uh, progesterone's always down. Testosterone may be up, uh, DHEA may be up or both. Um, so you have hydrocortisone and progesterone being diminished. But I have heard that estrogen can be high or low in PCOS. So how would you treat those people then? Um, I definitely give them uh, progesterone. And, and like what dose if they are not menstruating? High doses, high doses, like like a, you know, like the PMS doses, hundred milligrams four times a day, in oral capsules, plenty of cream if you're trying that. Would you do it all throughout the cycle or last two weeks? Just two weeks, but sometimes they don't know where they are. So um, I had a colleague who was diagnosed with PCOS. And she asked me, she had a prescription, got a prescription for 100 milligrams of progesterone four times a day. She asked me when she should take it. And I said, well, you don't know where you are. Start right now. And um, when you when you start bleeding, you can stop. And uh, she did that. And then she cycled for the next cycle with her progesterone. She became pregnant that fast. What do you do for the high androgens? High, high androgens will come down because luteinizing hormone comes down when you put the progesterone back. Or if you, if you have high DHEA, hydrocortisone can be replaced or you can use progesterone as a precursor. So do you do, you do the 
I mean, when you do the hydrocorti uh, the ACTH cortisol test, and it is uh -huh. normal, but you think at it, it is at the tissue level, it is it is low. Yeah, and you still could have exactly even even though that's that's an effect and seems to be acting. Does it actually get to the receptor to the tissue and produce the action? So it's worth trying. So I have a patient that the gynecologist put that patient on low aspirin and and in three months this poor girl gained 20 pounds and then mm -hmm. and she was being blamed that you ate too much which, 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 i know her that prior to beginning of this hormone her weight was 20 pounds less yeah then, then she had a uh, one period then another one is, is she had a uh, just the spotting another period, but she kept on getting uh, the weight gain and uh -huh. her, her bra, bra size from normal C size to it increased to triple D size. Right, so um, I believe you said low estrogen, right? The, the, the estrogen was not that low, but she was she was placed on low estrogen, you know, the yeah, birth the birth, the, the birth control pill. So, right. so consider this: the progestin blocks your progesterone receptors. You knock out all your good progesterone activity, and you still have, even if it's a synthetic estrogen, usually ethanol estradiol, it still is giving you estrogen activity. So, you've made this poor girl more estrogen dominant with nothing to relieve that. So it's almost predictable. She's got to get off the birth control pill and um, use progesterone to help her with reestablish re normal cycles. And also for PCS, look into low thyroid. Yeah, but uh, thyroid I manage. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the, the so birth control pill. It is yeah. normal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I yeah. have to give her the small amount. Yeah, the, but, uh, the hydrocortisone you think would help her? It would, but not until you, yeah, not until you get her off the birth control pills. Yeah, so that's what I told her. She's going yeah. off, but yeah. then I said, um, "Let me talk to you, but where we go from here?" So you would suggest to give the progesterone to her. Yeah, definitely. That's what she's, she's not missing. Going average case, she's. It's a weight gain of 20 pounds on a 24-year-old. It's just not acceptable. <laughs> yeah, that that's what happens to these poor girls. You know, I've been to conferences uh, with nurse practitioners and uh, nurse practitioners who work for the universities and student health, and I ask them what they do with a, a young woman who's missing cycles and has PCOS. They give them birth control pills and might yeah. give them metformin. That's it. Well, they, they haven't fixed anything. It, it just created more problems. So you mentioned something about March C, so the peptide. So, um, I mean, I use that. And sometimes that helps really good for the glucose uh, and, and uh, insulin metabolism. Oh, and thanks. Thanks for that. And and uh, that you that is the that controls their weight and helps their energy, and okay. the food intake is reduced uh, because you know usually during the cycle the food intake goes up depending upon where they are. But you don't think the progesterone increases the increases the appetite? Yes, it will if there's candida over there. Okay, and, and if I'll, there's yeah. candida. <laughs> Yeah, if there's candida, it'll definitely um, increase appetite. And if there is no candida, that then... shouldn't be it shouldn't be bothersome. In fact, will be a relief. So for that candida, you were talking about that carrot salad, but you you see, keep them off the da uh, dairy and gluten, and keep them on nice starting, Keep them on some initially some diflucan. Keep them off. Uh, what what else yeah so so just as you're saying there's so many tools out there to deal with candida so i don't i don't know what the best is i, I wish i did and um no i mean I those, those are some i know yeah. you're yeah, yeah i know you're you're quite spot on 
Yeah. So you know, you know, Dr. Morton teach um probably from AAEM, don't yeah. you? Right, yeah, so, right, right. yeah, so he's putting nice satin in every yeah, cavity. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, yeah, and that's his tool. He says he prescribes more helps, nice satin than, yeah. It helps, but not, not for a long period. But, uh, you know, it, even the oregano oil and the hyaluronic acid, all of that they have. So Yeah, they help. So there, there are a lot of things. And binders help when you're tr trying to kill candida yeah. off and... Mm -hmm. uh, a diet can help. You certainly want to get people on a cleaner diet. And PCOS, first and foremost, is the insulin glucose dysregulation too. That needs to be fixed. Uh, their diet needs to be fixed or they wouldn't get themselves in that situation in the first place. So have you heard anything about use of the spirinolactone and, and that the house that they do not produce a lot of follicles? Uh, and yeah yeah i have but i i really don't haven't uh done a deep dive on that much prefer to use real hormones not not altered hormones so have you have you noticed that after using progesterone in the dose that you're saying that after three months their ovaries if they do the ultrasound of the ovary uh, patient would not have a follicles i mean except uh, the and cysts on, on cysts. yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Not follicle cysts. Yeah, yeah. John Lee claimed that this would happen. Um, I I don't have direct evidence, but that uh, once progesterone was restored, the cysts would just pop. I believe it probably would resolve, but I I can't say for sure. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. I have an interesting question, in it re revolves around my wife being in perimenopause with salivary and blood testing showing huge estrogen dominance and someone that um, was gravita eight para vaginally six, never having any infection problem, medication, nothing for most of her life until she became perimenopause for six years before actually meeting the the definition of menopause. And okay, uh, for for most women, estrogen is at its highest in their lifespan in perimenopause. Correct, I agree. So, so she's so, she's she's probably running into that. Well, no, this no? is years ago. Oh, okay. We started with low dose progesterone, 25, 50 milligrams or yep. of which cause hot flashes. Yeah. And, and it, it makes it worse. Makes it worse. Yeah. And we never did go to these big doses that you're talking about. And I've never seen them used clinically as a yeah. compound pharmacist. Not um, 400 milligrams orally, certainly not 400 or 400 milligrams four times a day. I've never seen it use QID. Okay, but you haven't worked at Women's International Pharmacy, yeah. which yeah. which uh, made our success, actually, all this progesterone, according to Dr. Katerina Dalton's work. And it's amazing. It's amazing how it works. I've seen it work over and over, Carol, hundreds of thousands of cases. Carol, there was there was a, early on in the anti or, or uh, hormone world there was a something called the wiley protocol where they used yes oh yeah that scared the hell out of me they came to me and asked me to support the manufacturing of that program program that was didn't and they I use could, like 800 milligrams I, could, I couldn't do it oh i say i think it was 1600 and i think they went to like 16 milligrams of estradiol at its peak well the um, product that they were trying to get me to make topically wasn't even a viable product to put on the skin. <laughs> and I, I personally tried it with our cream base. And um, I will say all that extra estrogen really feels good. Uh, but I, it was it was making me fatter. So I, I quit it. And um, 
in counseling some of these women, they start with all that high estrogen and the progesterone can't keep up with it. When they go to use the progesterone, even that 1600 milligrams wasn't making it for all the estrogen they, they had. But some people, um, some people seem to be okay with that. There was uh, a doctor named Don Colbert who I've never met. Uh, he, he didn't use our pharmacy, uh, wrote uh, numerous books about using hormones in his practice. And one of his latest ones, he was talking about using more hormones than he had been using in the past, higher doses and uh, getting higher levels. And he said he himself um, had relief from a uh, years long psoriasis by increasing his testosterone. So he'd get in the, the top uh, tertiary of the level and uh, started raising his, his patients um, hormones a bit. Uh, most of their urgent symptoms were, were alleviated, but they were even healthier having, having the higher doses. So I, I, I think we still don't know the whole answer. Um, so, uh, there, there's a, 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 a sister group, AMMG, there's been over the last two years, uh, numerous, um, lectures about not blocking, um, uh, not using, uh, aromatase inhibitors and just letting estrogen levels rise in, in men, um, to crazy, crazy heights, um, 150, right. 170. Yeah, doc, Dr. Roussier, and he has, he has some good points, but I also have a bone to pick with him about progesterone in men, which he will not visit. He thinks men don't need progesterone. He forgets you have adrenal glands and intrachronology and mast cells and uh, your brain and everything and your Schwann cells all producing progesterone. So I think that is... Uh, rather a nearsighted kind of kind of situation so i i don't know about those estrogen levels but i would i would think i would look at progesterone and actually see if the progesterone levels are normal or suppressed and use progesterone first okay um there's another another doctor there camarella i think his name is he he, he does um pellets only and he'll he, he, his goal is for this is for males 2000 total testosterone uh -huh. 150 to 175 in estradiol um so what do you what do you say to the you know i mean you know this was everything we weren't taught <laughs> um you know 20 years ago we were taught you know get the testosterone levels to 1500 and the estrogens to zero so we know that's not right no, no, that's not right. That produces infertility in men mm -hmm. and uh, and men need it for their bones. You can't, uh, it is part of the bone remodeling nonetheless. And so so men do need estradiol. At, at what level is, is, is a good question. Um, I, I sort of had some trouble with, with pellets being so unremitting in their hormone delivery. That's not very natural. And the other thing, I, I, it seems to me, and I've just got this feedback secondarily from women having pellets, the usual progesterone dose they're given is 200 milligrams a day, but I'm running into lots of bleeders okay. with, with that kind of dosing. If you're going so high on estrogen, you need to have more progesterone or you're going to have bleeding problems. Well, my experience is the, the progesterone pellets aren't very effective, and so we don't use them. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a pellet for progesterone. It would be kind I've of seen, big. I've seen, Is there? I've seen I've seen them advertised, but I've never used it. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it it would have to deliver quite a lot of progesterone to be any good at all. Yeah. So, and what about? Can you address briefly uh, women who've had hysterectomies? Um, you know, the the consensus is still. I mean, they come in here all the time. My doc, my gynecologist said, I don't need progesterone because uh, I had a, I had a hysterectomy. Um, can you? Uh, I know. I always say, I mean, did you know. your, did your doctor pass his physiology course? I don't know. <laughs> well, so, you know. so it's really then you've got to blame the endocrine society and NAMS for putting out that garbage and uh they wouldn't have the hysterectomy in the first place if they had enough progesterone. So now they're being died, denied progesterone further 
and of course then they're they're good for the the drug market again for the benzos for the antidepressants the sleep pills the high blood pressure pills that's what's going on here uh, when you have those patients and you want to start them on progesterone make sure it's plenty of progesterone and you want to half the amount of estrogen that they're using as it'll blow it up so much right uh, right yes. and then, um and can you uh, tell talk a little bit about um you know high estrone levels versus estradiol okay uh, we're not measuring that enough because that can happen <laughs> and people think I measure that... <laughs> I measure it in every one of my patients that's we get that on everybody so and what are, what are you seeing um you know when the estrone levels get between up to 90 or 90 to 100 we 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 sort of don't like that so um so we we try to we try to uh you know uh steer them steer them away from that so we see it a lot with more with the oral est estradiol pills than with the transdermal yeah um yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised but that has to be taken into consideration you need balance or you need extra detox or or whatever to, to help those women and and also um now yeah, there's my old timer's disease. Now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, uh, there's a couple of questions here. Um, can you address the statement using three pot potassium salts alkalinizing uh, cancer patients? Yeah, you can find them on the internet. I actually, um, in the formula, um, if you look up Zeta powder, somebody's selling that from TC McDaniels. And um, the other one is if you look up Max Gerson's potassium salt thing. You can also find it. Somebody's selling that on Amazon. Okay. Really, really nice formula. But T.C. McDaniel um, lost his wife early on to heart disease, and uh, he practiced well into his 90s. He said now he was sorry he didn't know what he knew now to help his wife, but that was a cornerstone of what he was doing. Potassium is very, very needed for your heart. Yeah, you know, what do we think about uh, progesterone receptor positive uh, cancer? Cancer? Cancer, yeah. Uh, so um, John Lee said this, that it was a positive and probably, probably it can be a positive that uh, progesterone, it infused progesterone, um, it, it in, um, stimulates P17 gene, which um, stimulates apoptosis. You have a more favorable outcome if you have progesterone receptor positive cancer. Um, rather than not. So I believe it would be good. Um, I also I also believe it's hard to find doctors who would who would go along with it because um, nobody really looks into it, right? You you have this, so let's just avoid it altogether, which is which is not a healthy state for for the person dealing with cancer. Yeah, they can take estrogen. They can take uh, progesterone. What are, what's going to be their bone health? Um, you could give them testosterone. Um, there's, um, I, I wrote a synopsis of this book. I forgot the guy's name, Ed something. And he, um, wrote a book about testosterone with prostate cancer and breast cancer. And, uh, one of the things that happens in, in, um, endometrial cancer, I, I have a paper on this for endometrial cancer, as the cancer progresses, progesterone receptors recede. I think this work was done at University of California, San Diego. They were going to create a test so you could measure how bad the endometrial cancer was. In the discussion, the introduction to this um, particular study, they were saying, Something like 50, 60 percent of women with endometriosis had been earlier treated with progesterone successfully. But now we don't do this. We go straight to hysterectomy. So declining receptors indicates increased cancer hey, has, or endometrial cancer. Hysterectomy doctors have car payments, too, you know. So. Yeah, yeah.
I'd like to bring up something else that I, um, if I can have a minute, uh, back to that chart where we're taught, we're all taught that progesterone has to decline at the end of the luteal phase to bring on bleeding. But when we are working with those PMSers, they could have symptoms one, two, three days into bleeding. And so we kept them at the high doses of progesterone. Their doctors just said, you know, keep going. And they're as regular as clockwork. They're, they started bleeding on time. And I began to think that there's something else. Now, this is my, my little theory, but that it's like the area under the curve for progesterone. It's a secretory hormone. It prepares the endometrium to be secreted. So when women are started on progesterone, started on, not stop progesterone, um, all of a sudden they're back asking questions like, why am I bleeding? They're bleeding because progesterone has caused whatever buildup you have there to become secretory and you're getting rid of it. So we have this misconception that progesterone has to be stopped for bleeding to, to occur. Progesterone has to be there for efficient bleeding to occur. Yeah, I, um, to, now to help uh, answer Dr. Patel's question, uh, in the cancer center, we are using progesterone in relation to even uh, cancers that are progesterone positive with re progesterone receptor positive uh, findings. So again, with this thought theory, because progesterone, as we know, is actually has uh, an effect in the beta estrogen beta receptor, which is actually a protective receptor versus the alpha receptor for estrogens. But again, this is something that we were doing, again, under oncology, but there's a lot of scrutiny with this intervention. But in relation to what I have observed in the studies that we have done there, that this actually has not been aggravating these cancers. And again, be, be safe with the dosing, uh, start low always. And we're doing this under oncology's um, guidance. So just be, be cautious, but it is being done. Okay. Another question here is if, uh, concerning your finasteride comments, does it apply to dutasteride as well? As uh, dutasteride is, um, yep. <laughs> Use progesterone. What's wrong with using progesterone? <laughs> I'm just... I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading. Yeah. The, I'm reading the question. That's all. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. Don't, right? don't, yeah, don't don't be don't be the messenger here. So yeah, which which is a surprise to me because I see all these um, well these doctors like embrace bioidentical hormones and pharmacies and then they switch into uh, synthetic for for that. So why? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, V V three. You have to ask them. Yeah. Could uh something about could be fermented versus non-fermented soy? Does that does that make a difference? I don't think so. Okay. And uh the statement it does make a difference for uh whether it's suppressing your thyroid. Mm -hmm. Uh so Dr. Southern says she had a patient overdose on soy and developed breast cancer. So interesting. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. So 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 what is the consensus now on the breast cancer patients and, and treating them with estrogen? I know there was a lecture at AF4M this weekend where the the instructor was very passionate about the fact that uh, there's no reason not to use it. So what's you, what's your uh, what's your take on it? As far as as using it? Yeah. 17 beta estradiol. Was that Lindsay Berkson? No, I think it was Mindy. Somebody. Mindy somebody. Or Mindy. Mindy Pels? Yeah. yeah, I don't know because uh, some of Lindsay's stuff is tied up with that 2 methoxy estradiol, which is a different story entirely. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't really think it's smart to be starving the body of all these hormones. Back to the, the one uh, thing that even surprised me, this woman talking about empty estrogen receptors, 
creates inflammatory molecules. I tried to get the, her slides, but I wasn't able to get it on, on my app. So I have to go back and get it. So I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. So remember, it might- Remember might, who that was? I'd have to look it up. I can email you. Okay. 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 Anybody else have any comments or questions? So yeah, I got one one more question for you, Carol. Sorry. Um, in postmenopausal women on BHRT, are you a proponent of having them cycle that or constant dose all the time? Well, there's two camps, and I guess. Uh, for no real good reason, I'm in the camp of not cycling. Uh, when somebody's cycling, cycle along with them um, after ovulation stops. You really, um, actually Ray Pete said this too. What, what should a menopausal woman look like? Should The hormone levels should be like a young girl before menarche. And we don't know what that is for anybody, do we? <laughs> Pretty much, we don't know. So, you know, you would have, you know, like robust adrenal hormones carrying you along. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I always thought that was the way to go too. I, did, I didn't understand. I actually ran into some women who actually wanted to cycle and get a period back because they were so used to it and and but I have no opinion on that. I don't know. So that's why I would, I would ask you. Well, let's throw another wrench in, in, in that it's sometimes uh, theorized that women, um, when they shed blood monthly, they're getting rid of excess iron, iron yeah. and their, their heart attack risk um, is lower while they're still menstruating. If that would be true, it would be an argument for cycling. Yeah, I, I think their argument was just that they were used to it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was it. And it always made sense to me to just, you know, static dose everything. Yeah. Wouldn't that be an interesting study to do? Yeah. There's so many interesting things we could study. It, it's just never ending. You know, I've been at this over 30 years now, and I'm still learning all the time. <laughs> That's a good thing. We yeah. always. Well, as my mother would say, you know, you've been doing this long enough. You should know what you're doing by now. <laughs> yeah, at least have a clue. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, might I ask um, uh, about Wally? Oh, I, I don't know too much what he's doing, except uh, he's in Colorado Springs uh, doing cannabis growing. Um. <laughs> he's, he's not he's not doing uh, he, he's not doing Women's International. No, they sold out to Belmar. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Um, well, what do you think about use of genistein in patients then? Uh, the I'd, ra I'd rather use real hormones. Okay. So what do you say to those who say, I don't, I don't want estrogen, but I have hot flashes and night sweats and, you know, da, 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 da. What, what's your, what do you have a, a, a the little remedy, uh, well, for, first of all, with those night, I would I would look at the insulin glucose adrenal stuff, mm -hmm. and and see if there's weaknesses there you can address. So then then you you could trap me with uh, adrenal adaptogens. Now, I like some of the adaptogens. I love licorice as an adaptogen. So we could argue the same thing. You know, all the ad uh, adaptogens have that four ring structure like derived from uh, plant cholesterol, the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so I think I think it's like um, Ellen, Ellen Gaby called DHEA the um, biochemical equivalent of chi, but I think maybe it's cholesterol in that four ring thing that might be the chi. Okay. okay. All right. Um... Anybody else have any uh, anything uh, any, any common yeah any common uh, problems that you, you come up with with in you know with your uh, perimenopausal uh, uh, patients menopausal patients um, you know common themes uh, myths that 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 we we were all taught that that aren't that aren't so.
Oh, I have a, a little bit of news from um, A4M. Uh, uh, ZRT Lab has announced that they're using LC mass spec in saliva testing and blood spot now. You uh, realize they were using radioimmune assay or enzyme induced assay, so hormones before were not necessarily 100% that hormone. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know what that's going to do to the field. We'll find out. Okay. Yes. And uh, our A4M project um, was put on hold because of the, you know, their big weekend here, but I think we're going to be back at it by the end of the week and hopefully we'll be on their platform uh, shortly. I, I figured after the first of the year now, so. Okay. And uh, so Dr. Klatz put on here forum uh dot world health dot net is free yeah you see it on, on my slide mm -hmm. i see some people starting to uh engage in some conversations it's kind of fun <laughs> okay um, so that's the intent we we provide a platform for people to engage okay and uh yes and we're we're we've been talking with uh some of the folks there to move our program over to their to theirs and hopefully we'll mm -hmm. uh gather a, you know a much bigger audience so hint dr klatz <laughs> so okay <laughs> <laughs> so okay anybody else john you got anything for us wonderful talk thank you very much carol oh thank you okay all right so um everybody have a terrific holiday however you spend it um and if you don't spend it that's okay too uh, we will be here next. We will be here next week. Uh, we will have Damon Savala, so the the, hus the husband, Doctor Damon Savala, um, and he um, does um, uh, brain uh, restoration. So um, it should be fairly interesting. Um, uh, I don't know what kind of audience we'll have the day after Christmas, but we will be here. Um, and we're here every. Those of you who are new, there were some names there I didn't recognize tonight. Um, please bring one friend. We were here. We are here every. Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, we've been here for well over three years. Um, and uh, hopefully with our new affiliation, we're going to have much bigger audience and uh, it even even more, more, we'll have even more fun. So um, it was great seeing everybody. Uh, here it is. It's Mert Treatment uh, uh, Brain Restoration Clinic. That's, that's what we're going to be uh, talking about next week. So it was great seeing everybody uh, th this weekend, you know, in, in, you know, in person, you know, not on a, a computer screen. Um, so that was actually quite fun. And uh, we had some good time and uh, um, uh, hopefully we can do it again shortly. OK, um, I am on tomorrow for um, uh, research. uh, uh, uh uh, health Alliance, anybody wants, wants them going to be talking about non-hormonal ways to raise or lower hormones. And I usually get through in an hour, I go from uh, testosterone to through insulin. So we do the big five or six. Um, so uh, different ways to manipulate hormones without using them in case you don't want to use them or your patients don't want them, or you don't have uh, the credentials to write for them. What was their name? So, what was the name? Uh, the group? research uh, uh research alliance research. yeah okay so uh send me an email and i'll i'll get you the link if you're interested in that that's um three o'clock pacific tomorrow six o'clock eastern um and um uh we have dr farshian's uh conference coming up at the beginning of february um and i'll, I'll be there also and i know some of you will be there also that's in miami so um Thanks, everybody. Comments, questions? Um, anybody has anything that they'd like to present, please yeah. let me know. We will be here um, again next week, same time, same station. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being with us all this time. Um, I hope, hope it's worth worthwhile. And uh, I don't know who's yelling in the background, but... Uh, um, and Carol, thank you so much. Do you have a, we always like a little summary. Do you have a little, little, you know, going away, you know, like, like I tell everybody, my son was in theater for 20 years and we always want him going, leaving the theater, singing the song. So what do you okay. have, what do you have for it? Well, well, my message uh, 
is to uh, train your patients to recognize what symptoms are what and also to give them flexibility in dosing so they can address hormones. It's not, um, it's not like uh, conventional medicine, you know, take one BID and that's it. Your body fluctuates, your hormones fluctuate, and I think patients should be empowered. Okay, um, well, thank, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's have a a, a good uh, holiday season. Have a great new year. Um, and like I said, if anybody wants, um, so John, if you want to talk, I can I can kind of look up the uh, the link here because I'm getting a couple folks saying they want the they want the link. So. Uh, let me let me give me give me three minutes to get that, and um, I will um, get that. So, John, uh, you know, do your thing. Who me? Yeah, you. What am I supposed to do? Uh, just uh, just just uh, uh, talk. Uh, Let's talk about the uh, school. Any updates on the I school? Tell us about the school. Well, uh, I sent a message to uh, Doctor Klatz tonight. Because uh, he might be interested in some of the things we're doing. We uh, the key to the school is research, and we have a lot of members in our group that are producing products, doing different types of medicine, and uh, we might be able to link our research into the Caribbean, make it international, and that would then link to the school which is being uh, the research being done and directed by innocent students. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're still young and innocent and have a lot of brains. So uh, that's kind of what's going on with the school. If we approach the school, it will be through the uh, issue of research because they want to be advocates for medical students to do research and uh, the type of thing our group is doing surely needs research. I think we all agree on that. Do you have an idea when uh, they think they're going to be opening the school? Yeah, it'll be uh, two years, 19. The students will actually start pouring in uh, 2025. So the first graduates won't come out until 2029, right? But in the meantime, they have to do their rotations, which they're always looking for. And uh, we could help the uh, students rotate through our various clinics. And then once again, I think it's important that they be directing the research so they won't think we have a thumb on the scale. Okay. Um, it, 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 it's a it's a link for for uh, an email that goes that goes right to the their uh, um, their to a registration page. So it doesn't really give me a. Uh, doesn't give me a, a a link. So, um, anybody wants it, let me know, and I'll send you. To, I'll send you. To, I'll send it. You send the email to you. Okay. So, Great. all right. It's allergy research group. So, and it is tomorrow. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, thank you all, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for uh, participating. Thank you for being with us, Carol. Great. Great job. Um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna you know like uh the. Like I always say, I'm not very good at fixing things, so I only get asked once. So if we ask you back, that that means you've been more than competent. So. Oh, I hope you do. Okay. okay. All okay. right. Bye. All right. So thank you all. Um, we'll have the video up uh, as soon as it's ready. Usually within 24 to 48 hours, it's, it'll be on our AOSRD website, um, and um, that's uh, AOSRD. Dot org. One of these days we'll change it. It goes webinars. Um, so it's either that one or uh, on YouTube. Um, uh, I have it under my own name and it's Clearfield Medical Group on YouTube. And um, the, the videos are there also. Okay. So if you go on YouTube, like, subscribe and do all that silly stuff that they tell you to do when you listen to a YouTube video. Okay. 
Um, thanks, John. Have a great holiday, Dr. Quinn. It was nice, nice seeing you in person. Carol, thank you so much. Okay. Everybody else, um, have a great holiday. And um, again, uh, if you want, I want uh, to uh, for tomorrow. Dr. Bill nine at gmail.com. Just send me a message and I'll send you, I'll send you the, the I'll just forward the, the, the um, uh, email that they sent me with the link. It, go, it goes right to like a registration page. So, okay. It's Dr. Bill one nine, not two. Yeah, I get all excited, you know, there you go. Okay. All right. Um, and everybody that was new, thank you so much for being here. Carol, great job. Um, and we will be talking shortly. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. And uh, good night, everybody. Good night, John. Say hello to Sylvia. And uh, everybody new again, thank you so much. See you. See you. Bye.